I guess you can see my screen. Okay. So, um, uh, thanks for this opportunity. So, to, I'm Claudia Climent. As Juan said, I come, I work at, uh, I'm a postdoc in Universidad Autónoma de Madrid, and today I would like to talk about uh, vibrational strand coupling and thermal reactions, which is a re very, very interesting topic. So, to start with, uh, I would just like to, to uh, give a very short overview on strong coupling and chemical reactions. So there have been very wonderful seminars uh, explaining things about basics on strong coupling. So I won't go into the details here. I just want to mention we can have strong coupling uh, with molecules, for instance, in these fabric product cavities. So the experiments I will later introduce uh, as a motivation are done in microfluidic fabric product cavities like this one, more or less. Well, <laughs> this is a sketch. Um, also, you can have these plasmatic nano cavities with these metals, which are really close. Um, and well, uh, for a long time, well, uh, people have investigated electronic strong coupling, and now it's become uh, vibrational strong coupling with molecules. Um, well, looks very interesting because um, you can have the opportunity to modify uh, chemical reactions, ground state chemical reactions, without any external pumping. So this is a very nice, uh, different way to modify chemical reactivity. And well, after this brief introduction, let me just uh, give the most simple overview of a chemical reaction. So basically we have some reactants, we have some products, and there's some energy barrier. This is a potential energy surface along which the nuclear dynamics takes place. And well, this would be a typical reaction. We have this barrier. This is a transition state. This is called a transition state. And basically most organic chemical reactions, usual reactions can be, um, explained with transition state theory, where the rate of the reaction uh, is proportional to this quantity here, where this is the, the, the barrier. Okay, so very recently, in these recent years, several experiments have appeared um, where, uh, uh, well, which is the motivation of this talk, where, where uh, modified chemical reactivity has been shown under vibrational strong coupling to vibrations of molecules, so in the infrared range. And these were the first papers, these two papers here. I'm labeling reaction one and reaction two because later I will talk about uh, these two reactions specifically. And in these three papers, uh, the Edison group has investigated SN2 reactions, nucleophilic substitution reactions. These are very common in organic chemistry. And well, they, they found a slowing down of this chemical reaction when a vibration was under vibrational strong coupling with a cavity mode. And then there's other papers have appeared, for instance, uh, in here in this paper, uh, solvent molecules were under vibrational strong coupling and the rate of the, another reaction was, was modified. Also enzyme activity by coupling to water vibrations. In this paper, there's a whole lot of series of reactions where uh, they have been catalyzed under vibrational strong coupling. This is a, a recent paper where another reaction, print cyclation has been modified. So there are other reactions other than SN2 that have been modified. And this is very recent where the symmetry uh, of vibrational modes seems to play a role. So this is quite interesting. And just let me show you a very brief example of the first reaction modified vibrational, under vibrational strong coupling from this uh, paper. And well, in, the, in this case, um, this SN2 reaction was modified. This is an SN2 reaction on a silicon center. And um, this, uh, bond, this bond stretching, carbon silicon bond stretching here at 860 centimeters to minus one was under strong coupling. Uh, this is the infrared spectra in, in blue of the reagents. And in red, we, have, we, we see here the coupled system. Here, there's the Rabi splitting. Basically, what they found is that inside the ray, inside versus outside the cavity uh, decreases with the Rabi splitting. So this is uh, some indication that strong coupling, vibrational strong coupling is playing a role here, modifying the, the relative rates. And also, well, as we know, but Rabi splitting grows with the square root of the concentration, though they also verified this. And in all these experiments I showed before, it's very typical to see this kind of plot. So basically that there's some kind of resonance condition. So outside the cavity, you have some given rate, right? Uh, standard rate of that reaction. And then uh, depending on the detuning from the cavity mode and the, between the cavity mode and the molecular vibration, the rate changes. And the largest change is found here when, when both are at resonance. So there seems to be this, this resonance condition where some vibration related to the reaction coordinate is, is, is under strong coupling. So today I will, I will try to 
go through over these works, with our recent works here. I, won't wa I don't want to enter into the details. I just want to give some, um, like the important points of these two recent papers. And at the end, I will try to focus more on this, uh, on this uh, work, which will appear soon, where I've done some electronic structure calculations to understand this reaction that I just showed, but, and also the one from the science paper of the Edison group. Uh, under normal conditions with a stroke coupling, because I think it's important to understand this before trying to understand the complex vibrational stroke coupling situation. So let me just start by uh, explaining very briefly about this paper. So in this paper, what we try to do is try to understand how potential energy surfaces, which is what, what chemists usually think of uh, when think about a reaction, how this can be modified under vibrational stroke coupling. And what we did was use this simple, this Shimetu model to model a molecule, okay, where we have some, a double well pairs here, we have some reactants uh, that go to the products, let's say, this mixed reactant to product reaction here. And what we did was some quantum uh, rate calculations from Miller um, for one molecule coupled to one cavity mode. And we found that uh, this is a typical Arrhenius plot that with increasing coupling strength, this, this, this uh, slope varies. So this is telling us that there's some effective energy barrier which is changing under vibration strong coupling. Okay, and uh, well, in order to understand this, and since it's not feasible to do quantum rate calculations with real molecules, while well, with big systems which are of interest, one would like to work with uh, potential energy surfaces and transition state theories. So what we found, I won't uh, show the details, what we found is that one can, one can use cavity born oppenheimer approximation, which uh, is gathered in a paper of Anker Rubio's group, together with transition state theory. And the basic idea here is that uh, as in standard born oppenheimer approximation, you separate electronic, uh, fast electronic motion from slow nuclear motion. So here, the cavity mode is treated as a low nuclear degree of freedom and goes with the, with the nuclei, okay? And we, sh we, we saw that for this model, what we found was that when you have a vibration coupled to a cavity mode, um, the ratio of the rate and the vibration strength coupling versus uh, the bare rate, um, the quantum rate for different coupling strengths, the quantum rate, I want to focus on these red lines only, the quantum rate uh, agrees perfectly with this transition state uh, rate with the cavity born Oppenheimer barrier. Okay, so th this is quite useful. And then um, we wanted to work with real molecules so we can do quantum chemistry calculations. And we wanted a simple expression for how the ground state energy is modified in this strong coupling situation. And what we found by doing perturbation theory is this expression here. Okay, this is the, the this coupling constants for a system with many cavity modes. This is the ground state permanent dipole moment of the molecule. This is the static polarizability of the molecule. So basically, I don't want to go into the details, but this equation is the casimir polder uh, energy shift, or in other words, if we think of a molecule coupling to a, a cavity mode from a localized uh, surface plasma, let's say of a, of, a, of a plasmonic nanosphere. So this would be the Debye interaction, this first term, and this is the London interaction, okay? So this, this already tells us that we don't see this resonance effect, this resonance effect of, um, that is, is seen in the experiment. So this is something else. And basically we, are, we, we apply this for some systems, for instance, for SN2 reactions here. In this work, you can find these examples. So you, we can see how the energy barrier is um, lowered for SN2 and SN1 reactions when the coupling strength is increased, because in this system, the dipole moment increases a lot along the reaction coordinates. So in the end, uh, these, these are, in the end, um, uh, the, the relative energy difference uh, increases. Or also the, we work with the spin crossover transition, uh, spin crossover complexes where the transition temperature of these systems can be modified because you have a low spin, a high spin state. And by this coupling, you can change the energy, relative energy, and this changes the temperature at which you have this transition from low to spin high state. Okay, so this would be a, a main results and, and, and basically this resonance uh, condition I was talking about. So here what I'm showing is this um, ratio between the rate and the vibration of strong coupling for the Shima 2 model. I, I talked about this simple model I introduced before uh, for different cavity frequencies and different coupling strengths. So we can see that this is flat. Basically what this means is that 
um, there's no resonance condition. This is the vibrational frequency of the of the pairs we have there. So, as I already said, uh, it seems that strong coupling is not relevant here for these energy changes. So, this is another this is another effect. And uh, let me just point out that uh, these recent papers have appeared that they also they they also don't find you no know, collective or resonant effects uh, when trying to understand vibrational strong coupling, how it can affect chemical reactivity. Okay. So, well, this is our work, but uh, I was not satisfied. I want to understand this experiment. So basically, what I did was calculate this, the, the first two reactions that were modified under vibrational strong coupling. These are two reactions uh, with electronic structure calculations without strong well, I mean, bare, the bare reactions in normal conditions. And, well, I did this because basically silicon SN2 reactions are not common. And, well, there's... This, the reaction profile also is highly dependent on substituents, a central atom. This is, there's this very nice review here that explains this. And um, so basically here I'm trying to show how the reaction profile can vary from different situations of this reaction. So if you have silicon I, uh, SN2 reaction on a carbon center, which would be this reaction, this is the typical SN2 reaction, where you have a nucleophile that attacks a carbon atom, there's a leaving group, and then there you have a transition state, here, when you have more or less these two bonded, and then the, the living group leaves, and you have the nucleophile bonded to the carbon. So this would be the typical um, we learn in first course of organic chemistry, but then there are, there, well, depending on the, on the central atom, you have phosphorus, silicon, you have bulky substituents, you can have a triple well pass, you can have a, a, one, a single well if it's in solution. So there are different examples. So what I did is calculate I calculated this, this reaction and the first, this is the first reaction. So basically here, this carbon bond is broken and then methanol uh, protonates this carbon here and you end up with these products. So there are two steps. So we found this protonation step has a very low barrier. So here I'm just showing the first step, which is the SN2 reaction uh, per se. So here we have the reactants. This fluoride attacks the silicon, have a first transition state then we have this intermediate, this transition complex, and then there's a second transition state that connects with the products. Okay, here I'm showing the, the barrier for this reaction, and this is consistent with the barriers reported for a, in, at room temperature in, a, in normal conditions for this reaction, and also with the first order kinetics observed because there's a, a, an excess of, re, of reactants here. Okay, so basically what we see, we have a triple well pass, this is the rate limiting step, and the rate limiting step is that where the silicon and carbon bond is broken. Okay, and in these experiments, this um, this this was the the vibration which was under strong coupling with a cavity mode. So, um, well, this is the first reaction modified, and then I also calculated the second one, which is is similar. The reactant is similar to this molecule. Okay, but what we have is two silicon centers one bonded to oxygen, one to carbon here. This is carbon-carbon triple bond. And basically, uh, you can have this silicon oxygen cleavage or silicon carbon cleavage, and then you have these two different products, okay? And, uh, well, what I get is analogous to, the, to the, the, the picture I showed before for the first reaction. You have this reactant, it can go one way, silicon carbon or silicon oxygen cleavage. And in both cases, we have this triple well pass, okay? And there's this rate limiting step and the barrier is uh, very similar to the, to the one for the other reaction. And in this case also, uh, in the experiments, the silicon oxygen and the silicon carbon bond was under vibrational strong coupling with the cavity mode and they observed uh, uh, the, the rate of the reaction was modified under these conditions. Okay, so there seems to be that uh, when a, a, a vibration related to the reaction coordinate is under vibrational strong coupling, you're able to modify uh, the reaction rate. Okay, so, uh, well, but also these molecules, here I'm coming back to the first reactant, the reactant of the first molecule. These molecules are, are a bit complex. Well, they have different functional groups and you don't always have a clean vibration, okay? And this is what I'm trying to show you in this slide. So here, I'm showing the calculated infrared spectra of this react the reactant from the first reaction from this paper. And on the bottom here, we have the experimental 
the experimental infrared spectra. So we, if we compare the blue, we see that they match quite well. And this is the vibration which has, was in the vibration of strong coupling here. Here I'm showing a zoom of this area. And basically this, this peak, double peak is, is due to these modes five, six, and seven labeled here. So when you look at the vibration, sometimes it's difficult to distinguish and say which one is the silicon carbon vibration here. So what I did is calculate this quantity. And this basically is, um, this is telling me, this is the relative displacement between the silicon and the carbon atoms in this vibration along this bond. So this basically, this quantity tells me how much these two atoms are moving for each uh, vibration, right? Here there's this mode nine, which uh, seems that these two atoms are moving a lot, but in, if you look at the mode, this is due to the carbon-carbon stretching, okay? So when these two uh, vibrate, then this bond here, uh, distance changes. So this is not related to silicon-carbon stretching, but then if, you, if we look at the vibration at the modes, we see, we can confirm that all these, so the silicon carbon stretching is, contributes to all these modes. So all these modes have uh, some mixing of this with some other vibrations. And here I, I'm trying to, I will try to show these GIFs of these modes five, six, seven, which are the ones of the peak, which was under vibrational strong coupling. And basically these modes are uh, bend, uh, rocking modes of the methyl groups. So here you can see mode five, I'm going to play mode six, it's quite similar also. Well, let's see, there we go, mode six. And in mode seven, you see here mode six and mode five, mode five don't appear because as you can see silicon carbon bond, it, there's no stretching there. And here there's a little bit of stretching, but uh, from all, it's the one with the least uh, stretching, silicon carbon stretching, I would say. Okay, so it seems that mm, here there's methyl rocking modes, not, not pure silicon carbon stretching. So this is the, the reactant of the first reaction. Let me just show very quickly uh, the, the results for the, the rea reactant of the reaction modified in this work. So here more vibrations were explored, these three. Uh, silicon carbon in A, this is experimental infrared spectra. Silicon oxygen here, B and methyl bending modes here in C. And I just want to focus now on B, on this one here. This is the calculated spectrum. If it, it, it lies on 11, 11, uh, 1,100 centimeters to the minus one. So it's, it, it really matches the experimental one. And well, here what I did was calculate this, this quantity I explained before, but for carbon oxygen instead of silicon carbon, silicon oxygen. And, uh, we can see that this is like really pure vibration, but this bond, this, this peak is not silicon oxygen, it's carbon oxygen. And I mean, th th these are tricky things. So I found in the literature, uh, this kind of bending, stretchings that were once assigned to one kind of vibration and then to another, because I mean, this can be tricky to, to, to see. And here, well, you can see this vibration. So basically this is oxygen, this is a silicon here. So this is, oxygen carbon vibration and not silicon oxygen. And this in principle, this bond is not broken in this reaction, right? So this is something not so related to the, to the reaction profile. Okay, so well with this, I'm going to finish. So just like some final remarks, I tried to, uh, maybe too fast, <laughs> I don't know, uh, give the main points of these works and uh, well, basically, here we try to understand these experiments. We found some another effect, which is like kind of uh, weak interactions between the metal, uh, cav this cavity mode and, and the molecule. We applied this here and, and, and soon I hope this will appear where, where we show these results I talked about, these electronic structure calculations. So basically this tells us there are still a lot of things to do to understand these reactions, which I think they are very interesting because uh, I mean, ground state chemistry by placing in a, in a fabric product cavity. I understand from experimental point of view, this can be difficult, but I mean, I think it's very powerful. So just let me thank my co-workers, Javier Gallego, who already finished his PhD, CJ Garcia Vidal and Johannes Feist, and also the funding. And to finish, I would like to do some advertisements. So this is a, a book uh, that will appear soon, edited by Sasson Scheich and Thix Stuff. 
and it's on uh, effects of electric fields on structure and reactivity. And together with F.J. Garcia Vidal and Johannes, we have written um, um, a, uh, a chapter uh, introducing strong coupling to, so we aim to explain strong coupling to chemists that maybe have no idea about this and want to enter the field, or maybe it can be useful to, to also to students who start in the field. So, well, just to say this will appear soon. And that's all. Uh, thanks a lot, and I will be uh, happy to answer your questions. Uh, thank you very much, Claudia, uh, for a great presentation. And so, yeah, we, we have some questions. So, uh, Christopher, uh, you're allowed to talk now. <clears throat> okay. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Thank you very much. It's uh, it was very uh, very nice uh, presentation, and uh, I. I want to ask very, uh, like very basic question because it's it's. Uh, I just want to be sure I understand the state of the of the theory. Um, so if I understand correctly, you you can predict uh, from the theoretical point of view uh, a change in uh, in in the barrier and in reactivity in case of a single molecule strong coupling. But when you go um, to collective strong coupling, where uh, only the collective dipole is uh, is uh, is in the strong coupling. Then no theory so far can explain the experimental results. Is that correct, or I misunderstood? Uh, so uh, let me rephrase. So basically, in let's say in single molecule, we find these changes. There can be some change in the energy, uh, but the thing is that um, strong coupling is not a requisite to observe these changes. So in the end, it's not strong coupling. So it's not that, I mean... We, so it's a change because they are close to a metal? Or? It's, it's, it's uh, I mean, if you treat a nanoparticle, you get Debye and London interactions. So it's not okay. strong coupling. Okay. So. But we started from strong coupling, right? And we get there. That's what we get. But from the strong coupling point of view, so far you are not able to, to reproduce any experimental results. That's correct? Uh, no, and I think... I. I think there, there's no paper now showing like that they can show that, I think. And, and you have, do you have an understanding of what uh, even like intuitively because the problem I, at least that I feel is that uh, you have this collective strong coupling so you are only coupling to one bright mode out of uh, many other uh, uh, let's say dark polaritons in a sense and, uh, and this, the chemistry is a single molecule even so do you have an idea of this can of one of the, of the, of the collective coupling can play a role at the single molecule level? Oh, okay, so you mean that strong coupling is collective, but a reaction yeah. is a single molecule event? Yes. Yeah, so I mean, I I have no idea how can okay. I don't I don't know. I, ho I I think we all want to know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I guess so. Yeah. yeah. So I, I I wish I knew <laughs> or someone knew so we could yeah. understand this. Okay. Thank you very much. Thanks. Okay, now, uh, Jorge, uh, you can talk now. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Yeah. Oh, hello, Claudia. Hey. Very nice talk. So, uh, according to your analysis of the vibrational modes, then basically uh, what you're saying is that uh, it doesn't look like we, we should pay so much attention to the to the reaction coordinate and maybe explore to what happens in, in orthogonal modes? And maybe that's the secret to... Uh, yeah, who knows? I, I, that I don't know because... Um, but what I know from the calculations is that if, if I analyze the spectra, the vibrations, they... I mean, some, of course, some, there's some silicon carbon stretching there in that vibration, but it's highly mixed with different modes also. And so I think it would be good to have some thorough analysis, experimental, so we could see, is it important that the, the vibration which is uh, participates in the reaction coordinate, let's say, um, is it important that this one is in strong coupling or not? Because in, in the science paper, there's um, bending. So let me show you here. In the science paper, basically, no, the, 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 um, the ratio of these two products 
inside the cavity coupling to different modes is uh, a given one and then it's inverted outside the cavity, okay? And, 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 and they couple to methyl bending modes and methyl bending modes, I mean, okay, methyl are, are on the silicon, attached to silicon, but who knows? Um, but of course here, this, this, this one for sure is, uh, I would say carbon oxygen from our results. So maybe, I don't know. All right. And, oh, thank you. And Matt, uh, I think you can talk. All right. So yeah, just to follow up uh, on uh, Jorge's question. Uh, so even though in those experiments, right, they found that they coupled to several different modes, some of which actually aren't the reaction coordinate, right? So, and they still saw changes. So you don't think that, like, for example, the graph in the bottom right-hand corner, right? You don't think that shows, that's evidence that you can modify reactions by coupling to some orthogonal coordinate? Ah, here. Well, yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, you mean this one here? Mm -hmm. I'm yes, yes. Ah, yeah, yeah, sure. But they get the same result coupling to another one, so, right? So, so they get, they get the same result coupling to, to bendings, to silicon oxygen. And silicon, I think what would be interesting is, is, is to couple to the purest silicon carbon to see what happens there. If it's the same as this uh, silicon carbon here, which is mostly uh, methyl rocking modes. But, uh, but it, yeah, it seems that other vibrations which are not involved in the reaction coordinate were under strong coupling and changes were observed. Okay, thank you. I don't know if I answered. We, we have two more questions, but, uh, we're running out of time, so I would appreciate if you're uh, concrete with the question. Okay, uh, right. sorry. Um, Claudia, uh, this is a very nice uh, presentation, but I just want to uh, point uh, related to the first question of Christophe Galland. Um, I mean, we have a, a paper on uh, how electron transfer can benefit from uh, resonant and collective strong light matter coupling, but it's a bit of a strange mechanism because it's a non-adiabatic effect uh, that relies on uh, excited states, on vibrationally excited states. So I just want to point out that there is a mechanism for uh, resonant uh, collective effects on vibrational strong coupling affecting reactions despite reactions happening one by one. Now, the question of whether that is really happening is still uh, something that needs to be tested, but I, I just want to point out that possibility, right? Which is- yeah. uh, it's a, it's a different mechanism to what you are talking about in transition state theory, and we completely agree with some with, with, with all the statements that you are making. Now, the, 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 that's just to answer uh, Christoph's question. But now, yeah. the, 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 the question now I have is okay. So you are making these very nice assignments of vibrational modes. Uh, is this still a, an electrostatic effect that is independent of resonant conditions? And is it also independent of collective effect as you showed very nicely in the PRX paper? So you mean this last part of the talk, you mean? Yes. Yeah, so this, this, these are not, I mean, this is standard electronic structure calculations of um, organic reactions. So this, there's no strong coupling here. Okay. Or it's, this, this was just to analyze the reaction without strong coupling. Okay, but then what? Yeah. But what do you still stand by the fact that there are no resonant nor collective effects on strong coupling uh, for all these reactions? So I, I believe the experiment, I mean, the experiments show that there's some resonant effects. So I guess we're not trying hard enough maybe to understand this or we're too focused on one way and it's something else that it's completely different. I don't know. I, I saw there's this recent paper by Greg Scroll's group. Um, on no uh, entropy, right? I think. Well, maybe it's that way. I don't know. I don't know. Okay, thank you. Uh, we we had more one more question, but I guess it was already answered because a uh, person uh, lowered the hand. So uh, thank you very much again, Claudia, uh, for presentation and thank and if you can can start sure. uh, sharing the screen, okay. I can. Thank you. Bye. Next speaker. Bye. Thank you. So now our, our next, next speaker is going to be uh, 
Dr. Uh, Kyu Park. He got his uh, bachelor's in science at the, at the Department of Chemistry at Jinzu University at Republic of Korea, uh, he, where he also got his PhD under the supervision of Professor Dong Kim. And now he's doing a postdoc at Princeton University uh, in New York City here in the United States. So uh, welcome, uh, Dr. Ki Hyung, and you can uh, share your screen now and start your presentation. Okay. Um, uh, can you see my screen? Uh, yes. Okay, cool. Nice. All right. Uh, thank you very much for a uh, nice introduction, and thanks everyone for uh, giving me an opportunity to present here by voting for me and uh, by you know setting up this wonderful uh, webinar series here. So uh, my na uh, again, my name is Kyu Hyang Park. I also working in uh, schools group in Princeton University. I'm going to talk about the spectral signatures of polariton transitions in the pump probe spectroscopy. So. Um, so the, the results that I'm gonna talk about is about the febrile cavity and the strong coupling. Uh, and you, if you think about how the, how the febrile cavity is made and how the strong coupling is achieved, it's actually pretty uh, simple. So it's basically a metal deposition on, the, on top of the substrate and you deposit another layer of molecule and you cover up with another uh, metal layer which works as a, a mirror, two parallel mirrors that traps the photon. If the photon energy trapped inside matches the uh, transition energy of the molecule, then it couples. And if the coupling is really strong, then you have a two polariton uh, states rising uh, uh, in the higher energy and the lower energy than the dark state uh, transit uh, than the original molecule transition, and they are called upper and lower polariton states. And if you measure the uh, these polariton states in the absorption spectrum, you can see that uh, the upper polariton state. Uh, appear in the higher energy than the original molecule state or original molecular transition and the lower polariton state uh, appear in the lower energy side and than the original molecular transition and where the original molecule transition is it's completely suppressed and this is the reason why we call the this uh, state as dark state so in the like uh, the linear optical response of these uh, strong couple system is really you can, as you can see it's really straightforward you can see the upper and lower polariton states and that's uh, basically it. But if you go into the nonlinear spectroscopy, for example, if you use a pump probe spectroscopy using two different pulses to follow the, uh, the dy dynamics of the system, it's kind of not really straightforward. And you can actually see uh, different uh, assignments depending on the systems uh, that people study. So I want to show you the two examples here. And the first one is this uh, J aggregate cavity. Uh, where you can see 145 milli electron volts splitting in the linear uh, transmission spec spectrum. And if you measure the pump probe spectrum, then it, you can see it's pretty difficult and it changes drastically. So how the authors here uh, uh, studied this uh, uh, transient absorption, uh, transient uh, transmission spectra is by uh, studying the original molecules uh, optical response in the nonlinear spectrum. As you can see, there's an excited state absorption uh, sitting on, on, the, on, on the higher energy side of the bleach. And this was assigned to the two excitone state, which lies about the twice the energy of the, the one excitone state. And because they were able to assign this one excitone state and two excitone state, they were able to uh, reconstruct this energy diagram showing the energy transition from the lower and upper polariton state to two excitone state where you can see that these energy, uh, energies from these polariton states matches these excited state absorption appearing in the uh, pump probe spectra. And they were able to assign the dynamics with these excited state absorption to the population dynamics of their, uh, the, the, their respective states. So um, in a very different uh, system with a very different, um, a very different molecule, similar logic was used. I, I am pretty sure everyone here will probably know this, uh, uh, this work from the, uh, the first uh, polariton chemistry webinar. Uh, uh, this uh, cavity couples to the CO stretching bond of this uh, tungsten hexacarbonate molecule. And when you measure the uh, uh, pump roll spectra here, you can see that there's a huge excited state absorption appearing on the, on the lower energy side. 
And because this seal stretching is a you know vibrational stre stretching motion, it has an overtone transition from uh, the first vibrationally excited state to the second vibrationally excited state. And this uh, this uh, overtone transition is what composes this huge excited state absorption here. And there's another very interesting thing on the on the higher energy side, where you can see a derivative-like shape appearing uh, here. So this derivative-like shape comes from uh, the the contraction of the Rabi splitting, according to the authors here. And this contraction of the Rabi splitting is basically you deplete some of the population in the ground state, and uh, because of the depletion in the ground in the ground state, uh, you basically somehow reduce the the Rabi splitting because it's a proportional to the square root uh, n, which uh, the number of molecules that couple to the cavity. And because the Rabi splitting is becomes slightly smaller, the upper and lower polariton absorption appear in a different position. And for example, here, upper polariton absorption now appears in the redshifted position than the ground state bleach, and the lower polariton absorption appear in the uh, blue shifted position than the original. Uh, bleach feature. So now it adds up to give this uh, uh, this derivative shape. So uh, again, as you can see that these two uh, molecules, where, where while it's in a very different uh, strong coupling regime, they use a, they take advantage of the, the higher excited state that is about the twice energy, twice the energy of the original uh, molecular transition. And if if you think about the general cases, uh, most of the molecules that we are dealing with are don't really have this um, uh, a bit over some transition really set up, or even it's not really clear in most of the cases. So this motivated us to study if uh, it's possible to use the same logic to explain the, the transient absorption spectra of the uh, strong couple cavity in other cases as well. So we uh, chose this 4-CCIPM molecule uh, which is a very well-known molecule for TADF. So TADF is thermally activated delayed fluorescence, which is caused by a very small singlet triplet energy gap here. So here, as you can see, the singlet, uh, when you pump the singlet state, and this goes to the triplet state via intersystem crossing, and it climbs back to the singlet uh, state because of the very small singlet triplet energy gap, it is thermally, ac uh, thermally activated back to the singlet state and fluoresces afterwards. So uh, to be honest, we were actually, we wanted to test if this uh, uh, thermally activated delay fluorescence uh, dynamics is uh, perturbed or changed by the strong coupling or making this upper and lower polariton states. And uh, to tell you the conclusion in here in this slide, we actually couldn't see any uh, difference, which is again, very interesting thing uh, I'll discuss later. So with this 4 CTIPM molecule, we made a cavity which looks like this. And we try to couple to this uh, S0 to S1 transition, which lies about uh, at 450 nanometer here. And we were able to uh, achieve a very uh, large uh, Rabi splitting of about 1.6 electron volt here. And as you can see, if you tune the angle, you can see that this has a, a angle dependence, which uh, again shows that it has a dispersive character, which is from, from the cavity. And, um, if you measure the, the pump rose spectrum of the, the, the bare molecule itself outside the cavity, you can see that uh, it has a very broad features here. Uh, the, there's a very broad ground state bleach about 420 nanometer, 500 nanometer, there's excited state absorption, and there's another dragging excited state absorption which spans from 600 to 700 nanometer. And if you put this into the cavity on residence, you can see that the spectral features drastically change here. So, uh, and this has a dependence on where you pump, which polariton state you pump. So as you can see in the upper polariton state, there's a derivative feature and excited state absorption, uh, which pretty much looks like the, the, uh, the, the, uh, the vibrational strong coupling with a, a tungsten hexacarbonyl, hexacarbonyl case. And in the lower polariton, uh, when you pump the lower polariton, there's two excited state absorption uh, appearing in the very short time scale. And as you can see, the, the red curve here, which is the uh, which you probe here in the in the higher and uh, in the higher energy uh, side, you have a very fast decay and a long decay dynamics following. And if you follow the the lower energy side here, you have the similar uh, fast decay and a very long decay dynamics here. And if you overlay these, uh, which I don't show here, they match pretty much well. So all these very intriguing uh, uh, observations, we needed a uh, full set of uh, assignments in order to explain how this works. 
So we went back to a uh, Tavis Cummings model that we usually use to construct the, uh, the upper and lower polariton state in a single particle state. Instead, we use two particle state. Uh, um, we use two particle states because we are basically probing the state after the pump has arrived in the sample. So we use two particle state and we were able to construct these uh, two particle state manifold in the higher energy side. And as you can see, the one particle state has a, a Rabbit splitting of omega r, which has a dependence on these uh, number of molecules coupled to here. And there's surprisingly a two. Uh, there's surprisingly another uh, energy state that is about that is exactly the twice the energy of the dark state. And the, in this energy, which I'll just refer to as two omega state, has two different states, which is uh, ds2 state and p2e0 state. And this DS2 state is called uh, dark state two because, because the transition from polariton state to this uh, DS2 state is optically forbidden. And from this polariton state to, to P2E0 state is optically allowed, which gives rise to a excited state absorption later. I'll talk about this. And, and after that, there's a DUP state and DLP state. Again, this D stands for dark states. And uh, because this uh, transition from polariton state to this DLP and DUP states are forbidden, and this has a Rabbit splitting of exactly the Rabbit splitting uh, of the, the single particle state. And there's another, uh, there's two different uh, uh, transitions here, which, is, which are called UP2 state and LP2 states. And these, uh, these states have uh, Rabbit splitting of about twice the Rabbit's, Rabbit splitting of the single particle state. And this has, it's not exactly twice, but it is almost twice because it has a number of dependence here, as you can see, it's square root uh, of 4n minus 2. And this small difference will cause uh, something significant in the, which I will explain in the later slide. So uh, after reconstructing all these uh, um, uh, two particle states, we now we can uh, simulate what we see in the, in the transient absorption spectra. So um, after, pumping, uh, after pumping to the upper polariton state, we can assume that the population is now in the upper polariton state. And from the upper polariton state, we can uh, see which transitions are uh, allowed. The only two transitions are allowed from this upper polariton state is from this two, uh, P2E0 state, which I'll just refer to, to omega state, and from upper to the UP2 state. So, uh, because of the very symmetric structure of these uh, uh, this uh, polariton ladder, you can see that this upper polariton to two omega state has exactly the energy of the ground to lower polariton state, which now has an excited state absorption. And if you overlay this excited state absorption with the ground state uh, bleach feature, then you have this excited state absorption, uh, which you can see in the uh, in the in the experimental data. And from the upper polariton state to the UP2 state, there's an, uh, another excited state, excited state absorption, and it matches the energy of the ground to the upper polariton state. And because this exactly matches the ground state bleach feature here, you would expect there's no uh, feature left over here, while we only see this excited state absorption on the, on the higher energy side. But this is not what we see in the, in the real spectrum we actually see a derivative feature that is uh, different from what we can expect from this uh, model. So uh, what we actually went back to see what causes this uh, derivative feature, and we found out that this uh, Rabbit splitting in the two exciton manifold is exactly not twice the energy, uh, twice the energy, tw twice the energy of the Rabbit splitting of the single particle manifold, which makes this transition from upper polariton to UP2 states slightly uh, smaller than uh, the original uh, uh, state. So because because we don't have an infinite number of the molecule, infinite number of molecules that couple to the, the cavity here, we actually have a small contraction of the two particle states towards the two omega states, which brings the upper polariton state slightly lower in energy and lower polariton state slightly higher, uh, higher in energy. And because of this, you can see that uh, the excited state absorption on uh, appearing on the right side still uh, remains while the uh, the transition to the uh, transition to the upper polariton to UP2 state is now slightly redshifted and because because of this if you overlay these two uh, ground state bleach feature and the excited state absorption now you can simulate this derivative shape 
So the same thing actually happens in the in the lower polariton case as well. You can see that the from lower polariton to two omega state, they, this energy now matches the uh, energy of the ground to the upper polariton state, now forming a huge excited state absorption in the upper polariton state. And from lower polariton to the LP2 state, there's an excited state absorption which slightly blue shifted than which is slightly blue shifted than the uh, ground state bleach which forms this uh, derivative feature where positive peak is uh, lying, uh, is positioned at slightly higher energies than the negative feature. So now you can set up this uh, relationship where if you have an upper polariton population, you have excited state at the lower polariton. If you have a lower polariton population, you have an excited state, uh, excited state of sorcery in the upper polariton region. So it's some sort of a cross uh, relationship. So after setting this up, uh, you can now compare the simulated, excited, uh, simulated spectra with the experimental spectra. And uh, if you will see the upper polariton pump case, this matches uh, pretty much well. And if you see the lower polariton uh, pump case, you can see that there's a huge excited state absorption, uh, which matches our expectation here. But in the lower energy side, in the lower polariton region, you can see a huge excited, another small excited state absorption, but not the derivative shape that we expected. So in order to understand how this uh, is possible, we have, we went back to the dynamics here. So the usual scheme that, uh, the usual energy diagram and the population transfer scheme that uh, we have is like this. So if you have a population in the upper polariton state, then the population uh, is uh, transferred to the dark state via a vibrational ladder of the dark state. And from the dark state, because it doesn't have a photonic component, it's, uh, it has a lifetime of almost a lifetime of the original molecule state, which is most of the time longer than the other polariton states. And from this, this, polar, uh, this dark state feeds population to the lower polariton state, and from the lower polariton state, it now recovers to the ground state really fast because of the photonic component, which gives some uh, fast decay. So uh, as you can, uh, well, expecting from this uh, the energy diagram, if you, uh, if you pump some population to the lower polariton state, you will expect a very fast decay dynamics happening in a short time dynamic, short time scale, right? So uh, if you see, uh, if you follow now, um, based on our assignment, you can now follow the lower polariton population by probing the upper polariton uh, excited state absorption here, which appears in the upper polariton uh, region. So if you follow this decay dynamics, you can see that uh, this signal goes almost completely away within one picosecond. So we can assign this uh, one picosecond decay dynamics into the population transfer, uh, popul decay of the lower polariton state. And if you follow the upper uh, polariton, uh, sorry, the upper polariton population uh, from the lower polariton excited state absorption, now you can see a very long decay dynamics, which is expected because uh, at some point the population will be transferred to the dark state and dark state will have a very long decay dynamics because this molecule originally has a very long lifetime uh, which lives up to about microsecond time scale. So now we can uh, go back to this uh, um, very strange feature in the lower polaritons, uh, uh, lower polariton excited state absorption here. But before we go into that, we can probe this region. Um, uh, we can probe this upper polariton region after pumping the upper polariton. You can see that there's one picosecond decay dynamics and a very long decay dynamics that looks pretty much similar to the uh, when we probe this upper polariton state. This means that when you pump the upper polariton, by seeing this feature, you are able to capture a one picosecond dynamics which comes from the lower polariton. In other words, we can say that we have a upper, when you pump the upper polariton, then some of the population population is transferred to the lower polariton state, which gives rise to this fast decay dynamics. And a uh, similar thing, but again, surprising thing happens here. When you pump the lower polariton, you can expect one picosecond dynamics naturally because you made population in the lower polariton state. But surprisingly, there's a about 30% of the signal which gives rise to a very long decay dynamics, which are presumably coming from the, the dark state. This is very surprising because when you pump the lower polariton, you basically make some population in the dark state as well. 
So this is uh, when you, this has been already um, talked in some of the vibrational strong coupling cavities or electronic strong coupling cavity with a very small energy splitting. And this, uh, this uh, population transfers to the dark state has been um, assigned to the thermal activation by the bath, uh, bath energy. But here we have about the splitting of the lower polariton to the dark state is about 0.8 electron volts, which is almost impossible for a population to climb up to the dark state. So we actually came up with a very uh, interesting uh, explanation uh, recently, which is the free energy consideration. So what we see in the electronic, uh, uh, electronic spectroscopy is this uh, lower polariton and upper polariton state uh, uh, residing at the lower energy side and the higher energy side of the dark state. But if you consider the free energy of these polariton states, because the polariton states has a very small uh, energy, uh, very small entropy because of the, the synchronized motion of the all molecules that are coupled to, this lower polariton and upper polariton states can be shifted up, shifted up to the dark state. From this energy uh, diagram, we can expect that when you pump the lower polariton, some of the population will uh, can uh, can decay to the dark state, which gives the dark state population. So this uh, perfectly suits this uh, uh, this framework as well. So this, uh, as you can see, now we go back to the dark state dynamics, and we want we can see that we first wanted to compare this uh, uh, dark state dynamics by extracting the time constants of the the original molecule and compare it to the cavity itself. So we measure the bare film uh, dynamics and there's a three decay component, which is already pretty complex here, 140 picosecond and 14 nanosecond and one nanosecond here. And if you measure the cavity, it's pretty much the same besides this one picosecond dynamics, which, which comes from the lower polariton, pop, lower polariton decay. But it, as you can see that there's an 80 picosecond, which is pretty indistinguishable from this uh, 140 picosecond and one nanosecond matches this and 14 nanosecond is really uh, same. So as you, as you can see, uh, this distinguishing this dynamics from this uh, uh, time constants is pretty hard, but as you can see, if you overlay these two decay dynamics, after about 100 picosecond, the decay dynamics becomes pretty much the same, which means that the af after this point, the dark state has the same lifetime. So if we try to pursue this into the microsecond time scale where this lifetime, where the original molecule has um, a signal up to this point. So you can see that up to seven and 40 nanosecond, 40 microsecond time scale, there's an excited state absorption uh, feature from the polariton state. And this decay dynamics ex matches exactly well with the bare film, that bare film dynamics, meaning that some of the population transfer to the uh, to the dark state has the same lifetime of the bare molecule state without being perturbed by the polariton states. So uh, in summary, we uh, can say that we see, we've see we seen the two particle states uh, from the Tevis Cummings model and it, we were able to describe this uh, two huge excited states absorption from the polariton state to the two omega state. And we were able to uh, give an alternative explanation of the uh, derivative shape by uh, involving the unharmonic spacing of the upper polariton and lower polariton to the UP2 and LP2 state. And we were able to say that the LP state can populate the dark state via free energy reordering of the low entropy polar polariton state. And from that uh, dark state, we have the same lifetime of the original molecule. Uh, and with that, I'd like to thank all the people involved in here, especially Courtney, who uh, made this all beautiful uh, cavities and done all uh, beautiful, ex uh, beautiful ex experiments here. And Brian, Said, and Francesca, Daniele, uh, Barry, and Greg, uh, huge thanks to everyone who made this uh, work possible. And, and this work is funded by Moore Foundation. Uh, thank you very much for listening, and I'm open uh, for questions. Th thank you very much. And now, uh... If the audience has any question, uh, uh, Professor Pegfei Huo, you can talk now. You need to enable your microphone. Yeah, right. Hi. Really nice talk. So, uh, Frank Huo from Rochester. So, I'm curious about <clears throat> the derivative feature you see that deviate mm -hmm. from the Tanis Commons model. Was that actually due to the, uh, the counter rotating wave terms that you omitted? in your Tavis Commons model, right? If you're in a, in a very, you know, you're probably in an ultra-strong coupling regime, right. which means right. your 
your, your coupling strands divided by the frequency is larger than 0.1. Mm -hmm. In that regime, right, all of these terms matters, right? Exactly, right. So we, uh, because I know that we are well aware that this Robbie splitting is huge and we uh, had some probably effect from the counter rotating term and um, uh, this, uh, all the equation and the, the model thing was done by the, done by Francesca and she's done already uh, some uh, uh, um, calculation on this, uh, including the counter rotating term. And surprisingly, we didn't see that much of an energy shift in the lower and upper flariton state and the two omega, uh, two particle state as well. So we might have some, actually after that, we didn't uh, do much of a uh, work to see if the, the transition dipole moment or the, uh, uh, if this transition that are allowed now becomes forbidden or forbidden becomes allowed. We didn't actually check that, but the energy uh, shift from the ultra, ultra strong coupling is very minimal in this case, actually. So uh, we just pursued with this uh, model for, the simpli for simplicity, and it actually matches the experimental data very well. So yeah, we can actually, yeah. Can you explain the origin or your hypothesis for explaining this derivative shape? Origin of the um, origin of the hypothesis. So um, we so in this so this is actually a alternate. I'll say this is might be an alternative explanation compared to this Rabi splitting uh, contraction. And we actually thought of this the same thing in uh, in our cavity as well. But after doing some uh, experiments where we we can actually expect if this population uh, depletion from the ground state uh, is what brings this Rabi contraction, this should be power dependent. And actually in this, uh, uh, in this uh, vibration of strong coupling cavities, the, the power dependence was observed here. And I can say that because we have a uh, much more Rabi splitting than this uh, vibration of strong coupling cavities, we, are, we should be able to see much more uh, shift than the, this uh, this uh, vibrational strong coupling cavities. But in reality, we saw that, uh, where is it? We saw that the Rabi splitting is very independent of the, the pump energy. So we didn't actually see that much of a difference because of the pump energy. So this means that the population depletion from the ground state, at least in this uh, cavity, doesn't actually change the Rabi contraction that much. So we came to seek some alternative ex explanation. Thank you. Thank you so much. No worries. Uh, okay, now, uh, Joel, you can ask. Uh, uh, thank you. Uh, I, I found you, uh, I was going to actually ask exactly about this because uh, in the vibrational strong coupling experiments, we see power dependence and that essentially correlates to how much population gets uh, relaxed into the dark states. Uh, but now that you are showing this slide, my question would be, so, so, so we were able to explain this Rabi splitting contraction very easily just by the fraction of population that was optically saturated. And, exactly. uh, but my question would be, wouldn't it be possible to explain what you are seeing just by saying, well, the cavities are really leaky. So your power, the, the power differences that you are impinging onto the cavity are not very large, uh, the, such that uh, everything is dominated by cavity leakage rather than population relaxation into the dark modes and therefore you always see a steady uh, the same fraction of the population into the dark modes regardless of whether the power is 10 microwatts is that the way is that the units you're using all the way yeah, to 10 microwatt we didn't actually measure the fluent uh uh, in the units of microjoule per uh, square centimeter, but yes, uh, so I can probably answer that. So um, if the uh, cavity, cavity, so the as far as I understand, the population depletion from the ground state is what causes this uh, Rabi splitting contraction, right? Yeah. So um, if even if the even if some of the populations are delivered to the to the dark to the dark state, it should still have a Rabi splitting contraction, uh, regardless of the, the polariton state, which probably has some leakage components from the photonic component, right? Yes. 
Yeah. So if so, this means that even if you pump the uh, upper polariton and deliver all the population presumably to the dark state, uh, not depending on how much you deliver to the ground uh, to the dark state, it still has the same Rabi split. So I am not sure how this is um, like but, but, specifically but I, related to the cavity. Uh, leakage. I, this is a naive question, but wouldn't could you not explain that by just saying, well, before the population is being delivered to the dark states, the population leaks out? And that is happen that happens only for the lower polariton case. And from this uh, uh, free energy uh, perspective, this is actually some of the population are still deli delivered to the to the dark state. Okay, so then let me just ask then one more one last question. So, uh, do you not even see rabbit splitting contraction at long times, long compared to the cavity leakage? No. Uh, cavity leakage uh, time scale. Cavity leakage time scale. So the, the what's surprising about this cavity is that the, if you only consider the 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 Q factor of the cavity, it's really short. So the cavity leakage should happen within about at most about like thirty to a few tens of femtosecond time scale. Yeah. But we, the fact that we still see the, the dynamics of the polariton state as well as the dark state indicates that some of the populations are still depleted from the ground state. Yeah, but what is the waiting time? Sorry, waiting time? Yeah, what, what is the waiting time between the pump and the probe in your case? Oh, in our case, we test it from um, a few picoseconds here, as you can see, from few picoseconds to few nanoseconds, and now up to about microsecond time scale <laughs> using different measurements. I see. So even in the microsecond time scale, you don't see Ravi splitting contraction. Right. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, we, we also have questions from Professor Bing Liu, Professor Wei Shang, and Professor Jeff Oruski. So my question to the speaker is, sh should we continue? Uh, because I, I feel like there are some uh, interesting discussion on the yeah, yeah. but we mm -hmm. kind of run out of time. So it's up to you. Uh, should we continue? Uh, yeah, I, can, I think I can get about like two more questions, I guess. <laughs> okay, yeah. so let's go with Professor Bin Liu. Uh, hi, this is Bin Liu from City College. Uh, so yeah, yeah, just as what you said, you know, uh, based on, on the previous question, so you said the Q factor is very small. Yeah, and, uh, yeah so really large, right? yeah, like, uh, like uh, maybe like 20 femtoseconds, mm -hmm. but you assign the first, very first decay components, I mean the one picosecond as the decay of the lower polariton. So, right. I'm, I'm thinking if you increase the Q factor of the cavity, if this you know, component can be, uh, can be increased further. And also I, I see that there is a, your material has a very broad absorption. So that means there is a, over, there, there is a, there is a very large overlap between the lower polariton states and the dark states, right? So I think, uh, I mean, the, so the dark states will always play the role on the dynamics. So I'm thinking right. you know, if there are any way like uh, to explain the long decay based on the materials. Mm -hmm. I see. So um, yeah, we, I, we didn't actually test that much of a different uh, mirror thicknesses to say that we would expect a different one picosecond dynamics uh, getting longer or shorter depending on the Q factor, but uh, uh, based on what I know, I can expect that this one picosecond dynamics might be a little longer than expected. And uh, the fact that we are seeing one picosecond is, I think it is some uh, a support that even if the Q factor is small because of the energy, uh, uh, because of the coupling between the photon and uh, the uh, photon and the molecular transition, I saw some uh, paper talking about the, uh, uh, the, 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 the robustness of the co decoherence coming from this energy uh, exchange process. So I guess this one picosecond dynamics, which is probably longer than the uh, the, the Q factor, might be signify might signify uh, that. And uh, so the second question was about uh, what was the second question? Sorry. <laughs> yes. Uh, so I mean, the, your material has a very broad absorption. Right? Oh yes. So, right. 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 Uh, yeah, right, about that. So, <laughs> uh, yes, it's pretty broad, but if we, so we are coupling to here, but if you consider that how, uh, where the lower polariton is and how you can actually uh, go to this, even tail to this uh, position, it's still very uh, large splitting. 
So I will say this is almost impossible. We actually try to calculate with a very simple uh, uh, Fermi Golden rule type of uh, 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 rate equation, and it was very slow. And because it, it is very slow, I don't think that it's going to happen within the, within the time scale where we see this, uh, uh, this long decay dynamics. OK, I see. OK, thank you. No worries. And Professor Wei Xiang, uh, you can ask. Yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, so can I see the backup slide that you showed the derivative shape again? Sure, yeah. Uh, yeah. So um, under the uh, perturbative regime, if the shift is very small, then basically the shift would be the first derivative of your line shape. And uh, the amount of shift actually wouldn't cause the, the, sh the peak shift of the derivative shape, but actually the the amplitude of the derivative shape, which is exactly what you see. So I think what you see actually agree with the Rabi splitting uh, contraction explanation, where that uh, the number of n is very large, and the um, amount of Rabi splitting shift or Rabi splitting contraction is really in the perturbative region. Um, so you are saying that. Um, the, um, so we actually, oh, well, I didn't actually include the data here because we didn't, uh, I was not able to find the data, which I, which we did pretty long time ago. We actually tested a higher energy than this uh, energy scale, and we still couldn't find the uh, drastic difference between uh, this uh, spectral shape. So if, if we, since we have a very large energy splitting, I would say, if we have uh, some Rabi contraction, even the smallest Rabi contraction will be probably a little more amplified than as a as a huge Rabi uh, as a as a huge peak shift. So in the even even in in the higher energy uh, condition, uh, we will we should be able to see some difference in here. But still, we didn't actually see the difference. So well, well, the the what matters is not the size of the the Rabi, the original Rabi splitting. It's actually the percentile of the Rabi splitting contraction, right? Yep. So it's it's a very simple uh, simulation that you could do, just to uh, use use the uh, 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 transformations model, and then you put a large number of n, and you can try to change the number of n, and then see you can where that you can see it. A, a definite Rabi splitting change, but if you take the difference, which um, they would just uh, showed up as a derivative shape, and for a, a, a certain, a large amount of Rabi splitting contraction range, the derivative shape, derivative shape would just remain the same and, and, and wouldn't actually reflect the exact um, the, the peak shift. And, and the, the other consideration with, where that we actually did in our model is this: your experiment is a hyperdyne experiment, so so you need to think about. I believe the um, you know the the different amount of uh, amplification due to this self hydrogen process, which might also influence the the exact peak position in your experiment. Sorry, self self process. Self self hydrogen. Oh, self hydrogen. Okay, I see. So uh, another now I actually reminded this uh, question now reminded me of how I much thought about this. Uh, uh, speak splitting, and in the uh, in the first of polariton chemistry webinar, um, one of one of the plots about the Rabi splitting was about the time dependence, right? So if you have a uh, if you pump the population in, if you pump the population to the excited state, the Rabi splitting contraction is largest at an initial time because it doesn't uh, uh, it, it didn't go back to the ground state recover, is, which means that it recovered the Rabi splitting. And in the longer time scale, because the population goes to the ground state, which recovers the Rabi uh, contraction to the normal uh, uh, zero contraction, it actually changes uh, with the time. And the fact that we don't see this much of a uh, peak position change in this uh, position, we can say that it's, it doesn't really change that much in the, in, in the in the time scale that we are seeing here. So I oh, think that's, that that's will exactly probably... my point. I think the, the, the peak shift manifest as the derivative peak intensity in a different spectrum. We can maybe talk about that later. It wouldn't show up as a peak shift uh, unless that the peak shift is super large. Uh, and and uh, we, have, we have tested this uh, using a simulation and you can probably do that as well. But I'm happy to talk to you about this. Uh, oh yeah, sure. Yeah. Yeah. We can talk later, I guess. 
Yeah, and now this is definitely a final question of Professor Jeff Ruski. Yeah, so I was wondering, um, what fraction of the population do you think is being excited? And so this is something that um, I think I put in the chat that we were able in a low concentration case to be able to really change a big fraction of the population enough that we really saw the contraction almost go away. So, um, but I also want to take the opportunity to say thanks a lot for a very nice talk and for doing a very good job explaining uh, your paper. Thank you very much. <laughs> so uh, we actually wanted to push this forward to uh, test a really high power in order to see some sort of a saturation effect that you have already talked about in your paper. And um, because I am not sure why this is the case, probably because of the metal response itself, we were seeing some very weird signature, if, for example, a, a large oscillation or if some um, very unstable signal. So we had to actually stop at some power range. I think we tested a little higher than this, but after this power regime, we were not able to push any more. And about the population uh, fraction, we try to uh, estimate how much it is, but uh, because we don't exactly know uh, the absorption cross-section of the excited state absorption or in the bleach region here, uh, we don't have that much of an estimation, but I think it is probably pretty small, like, like the uh, like the most of the pump probe spectroscopy, where you only populate about 1% uh, or less than that, I guess. So yeah, it's uh, possible. It's a poss It's possible that we have to. We could probably test a little more to, yeah, uh, see some different effects here. But this model, the the point is that this model suggests some other alternative view that can that we can probably think about. Another quick follow up: Did you try with the lower concentration and a smaller Rabi splitting to see if that looked any different? Uh, I think we. I'm not sure. I think we didn't try the lower concentration at least. And surprisingly in this regime, the lower concentration wasn't really uh, showing that much of a, a difference as far as I remember. Hello? Uh, yeah, I guess that's it then. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you also Dr. Claudia Clement for being positive, uh, congratulations for being selected. Uh, very good presentations, thank you very much. And let me just uh, uh, just invite you to our next Claritin Chemistry webinar, which is gonna be featuring Professor Johannes Feist from uh, Universidad Autónoma de Madrid, who's gonna talk about how to quantize lossy plasmonic and hybrid cavities and how to use them for ultrafast claritonic chemistry. Uh, thank you uh, very much to everyone. Thank you again to the speakers and see you all next week.